Decadence is by far the anime of the summer season. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but these maneuverability things that they have are, you know, right out of Attack on Titan, along with the setting, because they live in a dystopic world where these god dolls inhabit the planet, and they need to farm them for basically resources. More on that later, because the first episode is really only establishing, like, a basic setting to make you think you understand what's going on. Like, look, we're obviously just, like, this setting you've seen time and time again. But this time we have a giant fortress that literally punches giant gadols and blows them up. Like, it's insane. But this isn't much of a spoiler, because it's revealed in the second episode at the very start. Like, the first few seconds explain it. But... Yeah, the setting is completely flipped on its head. This is not a survival story where this is the last remnants of humanity. No, Decadence, as the name implies, is the name of this fortress or like this zone where they're basically playing a video game and this is only a specific zone of the planet Earth, which is now ruled by corporations. It is true that this is a post-apocalypse, but Humanity has been deemed merely copyrighted, and now this this area and this decadence is just a video game for the rich elites who have now become basically cyborgs called Gears. But I'll explain the details as we go in because I want to compare this to a great work called Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher, and I feel it's the perfect fit to compare these two. Because the first chapter title of Capitalist Realism is literally, it's easier to imagine the world ending than the end of capitalism. And that's exactly what happens in Decadence. The world ends because of a climate disaster. The air is unbreathable. But capitalism has not ended. In fact, it has gained more power. And like I said, it has the copyright to humans. So there are two classes on this mega fortress of Decadence. And we have the tankers, which are the humans. And they're basically just like a working class. Most of the humans are not warriors, though there are a few exceptions who have joined the warrior class. Most of them are merely mechanics and just hard workers cleaning up the fortress after, you know, they blow up Gadol's with the giant fortress. And the other class is the Gears, which are the warriors, and they do most of the fighting against the Gadol's and the actual threats. So the humans aren't exactly aware of this reality, which is kind of in line with capitalist realism, since, as this text makes aware, it has become normalized that there are no alternatives to capitalism, this is just how things are. To quote from the first chapter of Capitalist Realism, The war on terror has prepared us for such a development. The normalization of crisis produces a situation in which repealing the measures brought in to deal with an emergency becomes unimaginable. When will the war be over? And that is much the situation in Decadence. The humans think ending the war is impossible. To them, they're literally the last remnants of humanity. And well, yeah, they are. They are the last remnants of humanity who've been copyrighted and owned by this corporation. The main character Natsume, for example, thinks the only solution is to defeat the Gad Dolls. And for much the first arc of the show, that's what she's aimed to do. Her ambition is defeating Gad Dolls and potentially getting out of this disaster. And her goals make a lot of sense. Her, she saw her father die. She lost her arm to Gad Dolls. Uh, it's pretty rough for the humans. Yet, the humans don't consider this a class divide. They see the Gears as merely just another race that's more geared towards being warriors, when actually they are just the Gears to capitalism. The Gears are the one who make the system work as it does. To them, this is merely a video game, and the bodies they inhabit are just their avatars. When their avatars get killed, well, they can just make a new one. To them, the humans are just the NPCs, basically, who just get the hard work done, the work that they don't want to do. Maybe there's a few cool ones who are just like legendary warriors who they can work with. But among themselves, the Gears are competing. They're competing for the top rank of the video game. They're trying to gain resources. The most valuable resource in this world is Oxion. And yes, it's basically the equivalent of oil. <laughs> they are fighting over this green substance that might as well be oil. It fuels decadence, it fuels their own cyborgs, it fuels the Gadols. Like, it is the resource of this world. So while this is a video game owned by the mega corporation Solid Snake, oh, I, I meant Solid Quake owns this size. <laughs> Um, I have to wonder, like, how much are they really in control of the situation? Like, it is a video game, but perhaps it's a bit more complicated than that. Maybe it is actually their goal to, uh, just take back power. Like, there's this one point in the sixth episode where they almost get the fortress destroyed, and that would have been a catastrophe had that happened. So, while this is just, like, one of their playthings, perhaps there are more ulterior motives to uh, having this 
system. Like the gears are enforced. There is a correctional facility for the gears that act out of line themselves. So there's clear that there is like control over this and there's probably a bit more to it than, you know, just the fun that they're having, supposedly. But yeah, to most of the gears, this is just a game. They don't think anything more of it. This is just the reality they inhabit and no alternatives can be considered. But yeah, the names in this show are very fitting. Like it's it's not hiding anything about its message, but like the, the military force in the show is called the power. So, you know, everything's on the nose here. There's like nothing that isn't like clearly a criticism of capitalism. It wears its anti-capitalist ideology on its sleeve. So let me read another quote from Capitalist Realism because, you know, even the gears are just tuned into this reality and you know, they, they don't have any options. They themselves are playing a game. They themselves are competing and they don't have any alternatives. They are forced into this as much as the humans in some degree. What needs to be kept in mind is both that capitalism is a hyper abstract and personal structure and that it would be nothing without our cooperation. The most gothic description of capital is also the most accurate. Capital is an abstract parasite, an insatiable vampire and zombie maker, but the living flesh it converts into dead labor is ours, and the zombies it makes are us. In this sense, the zombies are really the gears. And decadence is really this like abstract abomination of capital realized. We've seen some few elites who are basically part of the correctional facility, but I'm not sure if even they have control over the situation. I mean, it's questionable, but they seem to just be the enforcement part. I'd be curious to see if anyone is actually in charge of this mega corporation. That would be interesting. So let me introduce the second main character of this show, the guy who makes this all work, Kabaragi. Now his avatar is a human, but he's actually one of the gears and he's on a covert operation as a counterintelligence personnel. He's not very uh, enthusiastic about it though, but basically his job is to eliminate any bugs in the system. When he was a gear himself, he was playing in the power and was the number one top ranker for a certain period of time. And he had colleagues who looked up to him, but unfortunately in this game to like unleash your full potential, you have to like break your limiter. And when you break your limiter, you actually are able to die. Like your avatar getting killed is real death. And while this is illegal, this game itself advertises on the website. It advertises very specifically real stimulation, death awaits. So breaking your limiter is not allowed, but like it's clearly what the system wants. Like uh, it's just a hidden bug, but it's what the gears are here for is this weird death stimulation like necro capitalism stimulation that they're looking for. But his friend breaks his limiter and gets caught. So yeah, he gets uh, scrapped. And this kind of, you know, Kabaragi's done with the system after that. He's very upset, but he's punished too to become that counterintelligence operative. But considering he's completely aware of the system and how pointless it is without anything holding it up other than themselves, the gears, he's basically about to opt out of the system. He's going to commit suicide by not using the Oxyone resource, but he sees a small light of hope in Natsume, who is a bug in the system because the system thought she died a long time ago and now is not aware she exists. So she's kind of a ghost and yeah, we're moving towards how do we break the system? And considering this anime's 12 episodes, I'm really not sure what will happen, but I imagine there will have to be a second season because there, there's no way, there's no way that they overthrow the system in that short amount of time. Like I'm watching the show and I'm feeling the capitalist realism itself that like there's no, there's no feasible alternative here. Like what are they going to do? Take over the decadent ship? I mean, maybe they can do that, but they are only in the one zone of the entire earth. Now uh, we'll get into the solutions to this reality as we go into further into this text. But it really is just like that bleak from the get-go, so, you know, it's, it's just very interesting. Another bug that Kabaragi has is a gad doll that is basically harmless. It's a, a pet pipe, and it's a very cute little gad doll. It poses no threat, and then, uh, uh, that brings some implications that the gad dolls that they're killing for resources aren't necessarily, you know, they're sentient life. They don't deserve to be killed. I mean, they're kind of violent, but hey. It's not their fault that they're harvested for resources. That's uh, that's just capital at work. So Kabaragi trains Natsumi how to be a fighter and she basically joins the power at one point. It's cool, we get some cool fights. Saving Pipe from a Gadol, pretty great. But by episode six, uh, we realize that, yeah, the defeating Gadols is not gonna work. 
there's like too many of them. This is just a naive thought. And every Gadol they kill is part of like the scenario for how the video game is supposed to go. So to quote Capitalist Realism again from the last few sentences of chapter 2, what if you held a protest and everyone came? Which is basically describing like, even if you did that, like how will that change anything? And that's what I'm wondering about Decadence, like even if they had held a protest without all the humans, even all the gears, how much, yeah, how much would that really change? Even if they were united in like a front to destroy the system, they're, the way they're going about it now at least is defeating Gadols, which is clearly not going to work. And the fantasy that they possess right now, which kind of needs to be destroyed, to quote capitalist realism, the fantasy being that Western consumerism, far from being intrinsically implicated in systemic global inequalities, could itself solve them. All we have to do is buy the right products. And in this current world, it's believed that Oxyone is that product that will just save the world. Which is clearly not true. It is the fuel that is uh, causing global inequalities, in fact. So, yeah. Not great. There's going to have to be another alternative and a simple protest and belief in consumerism is not going to change that. So I just want to like elaborate on why the gears and the humans and the distinction between them is so interesting. Because as capitalism realism makes clear that there are like two different eras of production. And as it defines it in this text, it is uh, Fordism and post-Fordism. So you can think of Fordism as like the production line and this type of work that is separated by buildings and spaces. Well, the post fortis is that we have the net. It is a completely different mode of communication, and work is completely different. Uh, we live in like a gig economy now. So the world the humans inhabit feels a lot like that fortis mode. They are making armor repairs. They're just cleaning the fortress. They're doing jobs like that. Well, the gears are literally working almost as the gig economy employees. They are accepting quests. They're going on quests. They're buying loot with their currency. They inhabit two completely different worlds. To quote capitalist realism, the Fortis factory was cruelly divided into blue and white collar work, with the different types of labor physically delimited by the structure of the building itself, laboring in noisy environments, watched over by managers and supervisors. Workers had access to language only in their breaks, in the toilet, at the end of the working day, or when they were engaged in sabotage, because communication interrupted production. But in post-Fortism, when the assembly line became a flux of information, people work by communicating. As Norbert Weiner taught, communication and control entail one another. So yeah, I just find that so fascinating. These are like two different ways of labor, but they're both being controlled by a similar means. Like we see the classic way of Fordism and control through the humans. But the gears just make it more closer to like our modern world where communication takes an essential role. One of the anecdotes in capitalist realism is that Fisher, I believe, saw a student who had a pair of headphones, and they had these headphones on, and they weren't listening to anything as they were studying, they just were wearing them, because, you know, they can. <laughs> That's something I often do when I'm just, like, taking notes or something, I'm wearing headphones for literally no reason when I'm writing, and sometimes they were studying and they had their headphones off, but when they had their headphones off, the music was still playing. So, to quote the text directly, like, what this means is the use of headphones is significant here. Pop is experienced not as something which could have impacts upon public space, but as a retreat into private oedipod, consumer bliss. I'm not sure what that would mean, so I'm going to just put on the screen. A walling up against the social. And that's the state the gears are in. They are in a state of consumer bliss. And as Fisher likes to point out, a matrix of sorts. So I think the distinction is clear here. The gears, while part of like the oppressors kind of, like they're in the power, and they're aware of what the system is. They're aware that the humans actually die, um, but they don't care. They, they're apathetic. They've given up hope. Uh, they're, they're in consumer bliss. I think it's clear here that these gears are basically living in the first world. They are the people. In reality, they would be the people who are exploiting the products from, you know, the third world. They are exploiting other countries, but like, it's just an anime, so the humans here are are representative of that. They are just, you know, the normal workers whose labor is exploited and... But the thing is, they're both controlled. <laughs> both of these classes are under the control of, like, this mega corporation in this example. They're complicit and they could definitely have a revolution of their own that would be based, but... But yeah, unfortunately the Gears have bought into this myth that, you know, this is the only option. This is their life and they're gonna play the video game, they're gonna have fun, and they're gonna get their little check of Oxyone and a little dopamine. Like, that's all the world is to them. And that's just capitalist realism. 
unfortunately. Because while we think consuming these like Western products of, and divulging into consumerism will change anything, it won't. And it's merely causing the system of global inequality. And it's funny. I, I was kind of a bit more optimistic about the world at the start of 2020. I mean, who wasn't? 2020 hit like a truck. But at the start of the year, I just got like a new Nintendo Switch. And I was playing Monster Hunter Generations while listening to Bernie Sanders like uh, live streams. I was listening to his rallies. I was listening to commentary on the election season. And looking back on it, it's kind of dumb. I have literally no hope at this point for bourgeoisie elections. Yeah, I stand by the quote, if voting changed anything, it would be made illegal. And as we see in the global world, any election that doesn't play out as they want, that, that meaning the capitalists, any election that doesn't go their way is illegitimate. They'll overthrow it, like Bolivia, for example. And now we have the example of Belarus, where they're trying to have a color revolution against Lukashenko. So critical support for Lukashenko. Um, the last thing you want is that socialist economy to be completely dismantled, which is all they want to do. Really, they have no like morality reason for overthrowing this guy. They just want to dismantle the system that Belarus is like the bastion of like the Soviet bloc. It's like one of the last ones. So they just want to dismantle that. That's that's all they want there and privatize it. Oh, that's a word I haven't been using this whole thing. But yeah, the decadence is like the clear example of everything being privatized. So I was playing Monster Hunter. I was watching the failure of Bernie's election. He obviously lost, which is kind of sad, but it was inevitable. Voting wasn't going to achieve anything there. And as it got later into like the failure and seeing him lose, there was like, you know, little sparks of hope, but they were just illusions. And I had to wonder to myself, what was I hunting? And I feel like that's the feeling that Natsume will have. Why is she hunting these Gadolls? What, what purpose? And to me, maybe those monsters were, you know, the abomination that is capital. But it's clear it was going to take a lot more work than simply electing a socialist. That's something that didn't even work and the bourgeoisie elections are obviously not going to achieve anything. We're going to have to be realistic about socialism and we're going to have to be realistic about what capitalism really is. I've seen this comment a lot, but a lot of people really are just bought into this capitalist realism. They think there are no other alternatives because this is just human nature. So I'm going to say another good quote from capitalist realism because I think this is important. I really did not talk about this privatization thing all that much in this video. So to quote, Over the past 30 years, capitalist realism has successfully installed a business ontology in which it is simply obvious that everything in society, including healthcare and education, should be run as a business. As any number of radical theorists, from Brechet through Foucault and Baidot, emancipatory politics must always destroy the appearance of a natural order, must reveal what is presented as necessary and inevitable to be a mere contingency, just as it must make what was previously deemed to be impossible seem attainable. And that really is the first arc of decadence. Kabaragi has given up, but through Natsumi he sees that maybe this is actually is attainable. The whole plan of decadence is a contingency plan for the collapse of the world. This mega corporation is like a contingency plan. And just like imperialism, it is a paper tiger. Just keep that in mind, like what we see here as just like simply the natural order in reality, it doesn't take much to get a social movement to start something new. It isn't as impossible as it seems. And to quote from Capitalism again for a bit of advice of how we're going to do this in this year of 2020 where everything seems to be disaster and the bourgeoisie are capitalizing on the disaster like no one else. The failure of previous forms of anti-capitalist political organization should not be a cause for despair. But what needs to be left behind is a certain romantic attachment to the politics of failure to the comfortable position of a defeated marginality. <clears throat> what this means is we need to let go of socialism that has lost. We need to embrace actual existing socialism in <clears throat> China. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, had a little bit of cough there. Crisis is an opportunity, but it needs to be treated as a tremendous speculative challenge, a spur for renewal that is not a return. As Bido has forcefully insisted, an effective anti-capitalism must be a rival to capital, not a reaction to it. There can be no return to pre-capitalist territorialities. Anti-capitalism must oppose capitalist globalism with its own authentic universality. So take that quote as you will. You can probably use that quote to be anti-China, but to me, considering the Belt and Road Initiative and how China on all steps opposes imperialism, I think China is the light of, you know, capitalist realism will not hold out. I'll link a Medium blog post, but China is showing that Marxism-Leninism is going to be the new dominant ideology of the world. But to the capitalists who are so adherent to their own ideology, 
of neoliberalism and neoconservatism, China is merely a bug that needs to be quashed. This is why they're so gung-ho about going to war in the trade war and banning TikTok of all things. Oh my god. They're literally trying to scrap any opposition that speaks against their interest or is not owned by them. They need to privatize everything. Anything that they don't have privatized is a threat. And the banning of TikTok is clear. Like, yeah, this new form of communication, the internet, is considered by many a weapon. <laughs> and it has been for a long time. So you should consider that every time you think like, oh, why is China censoring the internet? No, they just don't want Google because Google is like used as a tool. Facebook and Google used as a tool for color revolution, by the way. As one of the characters from Decadence points out, who again, part of the enforcement team, there's no place for bugs in this world. He tries to make Kaburagi repeat that, that there's no place for bugs in this world. The world does not need bugs, what he says. Kaburagi responds, this world needs bugs. And I have to agree. Despite how bleak capitalist realism is, remember that capitalism is a snake that eats its own tail. By presenting in a socialist alternative, I'm sure it will be replaced. So please leave a comment, check out the description for the link to the PDF of this Capitalist Realism book. It's a really short read, and it's a good read. I hope you stick around, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a like. There's a lot more exciting content to come.